Buonasera. Good evening. Good evening to all of you. Each one of us now could order a book or a washing machine, pay a bank transfer, fines or the utilities, book a plane, a taxi, or an Uber car. Check the heartbeat. A farmer uh, uh, could even uh, uh, check uh, uh, crop irrigation with a census reducing 80% uh, water, uh, water consumption by 80% and could do many more things. This is quite recent, but we've already got used to that because the digital change is very fast, very impactful and scattered everywhere and we get used to it very easily. Not to mention robotics, artificial intelligence, and many systems behind uh, all these applications. For all of us, these are great opportunities. But uh, there are also some criticalities in all that. This is what we're going to discuss today, uh, together with Sara Calefi, Marketplace Director for Amazon Italy. Ali Reza Rabia, uh, Chairman and CEO of Jayco Taikisha, and Marco Bardazzi, a Communications Director at ENI. So we have three representatives from three different important sectors in digital change, as in trade, distribution, uh, manufacturing and services. What is lacking here is communication, which is uh, the other major pillar where digital change is of the utmost importance, and Marco Bardazzi is a great expert in that sector too. We could also talk about that maybe at the end. Now, let's start with Amazon. Founded in 1994-5, it's a company with uh, a turnover of about 140 billion today, uh, more than 350,000 employees, 1.6 billion euro in investments in Italy only, 3,600 employees in Italy only, and 1,700 uh, will join the company uh, in the near future. Therefore, it has an enormous feedback and uh, uh, success among the population. My first question is the following. What is a marketplace? Because it's a bit different from uh, the uh, usual way of ordering a book. Why? Because it clearly it collaborates directly with SMEs in our uh, country. So can you please explain to us uh, what the system is like, how it works, uh, and what are its opportunities? Why have you chosen this system? And what are the problems lying behind it? I will. First of all, uh, greetings to you all. Thank you very much to the chairman. Um, uh, Bernard Schultz, Compagnia delle Opere, and for giving me the opportunity to talk, to talk about Amazon today. This is a very topical issue, and it is very important for the uh, a corporate culture in Amazon and Amazon employees. As for the opportunities of the digital world, uh, I think that they are clear to everyone, as in uh, the consumer uh, increasingly uh, wants to uh, have a purchasing model to buy things uh, which is very different from the traditional way of buying. So they look for objects, uh, for products in the internet. Uh, they are very fast in their interactions, uh, interactions which are very safe and secure. The post sales service uh, is top quality. And uh, so they ask for more always. 
And you can lag behind it if you don't understand that. So the opportunity provided by Amazon Marketplace is very clear. I'll give you some figures. E-commerce is a market of 2,000 billions, huge amount of money. If compared to the uh, total retail, it is still a low percentage. If you think about the UK, for example, e-commerce accounts for 19% of the retail market. It continuously grows which makes you understand uh, why opportunities are evolving. In Italy, this is even more so, a market of 24 billion, which only accounts for 6% of the retail sector, and it has a double-digit increase. Today, uh, the digital change is quite clear, is crystal clear, and it will be even more so over the the next two or three years. So for Amazon, the risk is not to do anything, to uh, um, be very slow. This is why Amazon tries to help the company to uh, grasp uh, the opportunities of offered by the digital market. We're still like behind in Italy. With reference to SMEs and to the percentage of SMEs using the digital uh, market, uh, there's very few of them. Only 10% SMEs uh, use uh, an online channel. But uh, they can uh, market abroad when they do so. And they are very successful because the Made in Italy uh, is very successful. So an Italian company uh, having a marketplace on the internet uh, goes abroad is very successful. 55% of Italian uh, uh, companies uh, um, are going abroad uh, are successful. So uh, Amazon wants to increase that, wants to increase the number of uh, companies using e-commerce as an additional channel, a, cha a channel which is complementary to the traditional one. Now, this is the concept of marketplace. It's a, as simple as that. The marketplace uh, was born some 20 years ago in Amazon. Before that, uh, Amazon just had products offered by Amazon on its website. 20 years ago, a decision was made to launch the marketplace. Today, it could be taken for granted because you have many companies inside Amazon offering a, offering a product. But 20 years ago, that decision was quite a peculiar one. It meant uh, opening up the doors of our website to competitors. Because at the end of the day, the same product uh, before 20 years ago uh, was just offered by Amazon. After the opening of the marketplace, different companies were competing on Amazon website, selling the same product. So different school of thoughts were developed in Amazon. Some people thought that that was the way ahead. Some others thought that it was a crazy decision. Amazon decided to invest in that, and results are crystal clear. More than half of Amazon turnover today comes from uh, third sellers. That applies in uh, total numbers, uh, and it is even more so in Italy. So, it, maybe it, it, it couldn't have worked. It could have been a failure, but it did work. At the beginning, the two attempts to launch the marketplace actually were not successful. So, I'll tell you the history of the marketplace, just as an, an example of how an action can fail, and you have to consider that, or can be successful, thus leading to excellent results. 20 years ago, the marketplace was launched. Two attempts were made before finding the right solution. The first attempt was a, a website based on an auction. Uh, we tried to copy eBay, basically. Uh, maybe we were wrong. And uh, we realized that uh, uh, consumers actually did not buy from the uh, uh, marketplace website because on the one hand, on Amazon website, they were immediately satisfied with the um, purchase, but on the other, uh, on the marketplace, uh, they had to wait for uh, the, uh, to see whether they could buy or not. Then uh, we continued innovating and we made a second attempt. Uh, the second attempt uh, was uh, based on a fixed price. 
So the pro the price of the product sold by Amazon was decided by Amazon. The price of the product sold by a third part party was uh, defined by the third party. But the two products were offered on different pages. So from a consumer's perspective, it was very inconvenient. If they had to look for a book, they had to look for a book on Amazon page and then do the same thing on the marketplace place. And that didn't work. So we moved to, we shifted to a totally new concept, a very simple concept, which is what is still applied today. As in the concept of one product page, just one product page, and then we list all the offers by Amazon and third parties. And that was the key to success, uh, leading to uh, our excellent results. Now, uh, there is more than 10,000 Italian companies on Amazon website. Uh, they created many jobs. An external survey talks about uh, more than uh, 10,000 jobs uh, uh, created by these uh, SMEs uh, selling on Amazon. One out of three companies exports abroad, uh, and the uh, export uh, has a total value of 350 million euros. So, wonderful results. So, starting from the marketplace, let's take a step back and uh, uh, let's talk about uh, uh, Amazon corporate culture and what innovation is for us. Amazon is not just a marketplace, but it's also an EWS, as in um, Amazon Web Services, a Kindle, uh, a, a system of smart supermarkets. Uh, it's uh, a service uh, with uh, uh, home shopping, uh, Alexa. So Amazon is a set of innovations. It's difficult to uh, give a definition of our company. The commonality uh, is a very, very simple principle. It's always the first day for us. This is a sentence that our founder, Jack Bezos, continues to say and continues to repeat year after year. It's always the first day implies a wonderful concept, a very simple one. Just imagine your first day of work or the first day of anything. So you get to work and you are excited. You want to work. Uh, uh, you want to uh, uh, know people. Uh, you want people to know you. So the, your first day of work, uh, uh, on your first day of work, everything seems possible. And the, uh, the right attitude is, is, yes, we can do it. Yes, I can do it. Now, this is uh, Amazon corporate cult uh, culture in any sector. The first day culture, so it's the first day always, is based on three fundamental pillars and principles. Uh, customer obsession, as in, if you innovate, you innovate for somebody. So uh, the, the customer is your basis to work on. The second pillar is pretty much connected to today's topic, innovation and failure. You innovate, but you know that you can fail. So you have to accept failure as one of the uh, possible results, even though uh, maybe uh, you won't be understood. The third pillar uh, is long-term uh, orientation. You cannot innovate uh, if then you are worried about uh, results, uh, financial results on the stock exchange in the next quarter. So these are the three main pillars we're based on. Now, uh, customer obsession. Many people, uh, sorry, many uh, companies are customer friendly, so to speak. Uh, Amazon has its own peculiar way to interpret that. When we innovate, we innovate for somebody. So we always start from the users of the product, which is very useful for customers because we bring something new compared to the traditional approach. What would the customers say about that? Because there is no innovation for the sake of itself. The innovation exists only if it is used by somebody. So. I give you an example. I mentioned Prime Now. 
uh, which is our uh, uh, home delivery of uh, shopping. It applies in the main cities of the worldwide. Uh, in one hour, you can have what you order back home, at home. So it meets a very uh, specific need. As in, we want to help our customers uh, to do shopping, uh, to avoid uh, uh, queuing up, uh, to have something at home within an hour. Amazon thought about this uh, uh, product uh, with uh, a press release. So basically, we've got something in mind and uh, we put it in a press release so that when we have our idea in our mind, uh, we want to see how uh, the uh, consumer is going to uh, uh, welcome it. Uh, we describe the product, we write down the press release so that uh, we think about the product in every single detail. Uh, the concept of Prime Now was uh, uh, approved. When it was approved, uh, we shifted from the concept of a press release to the first order that was uh, uh, sent in uh, 101 days. And it's a very complex because it implies logistics, shipping, uh, uh, warehousing. So everything was very fast. Then uh, there is uh, other types of innovation targeting customers. For example, innovations coming from our sectors. London Code, for example, which comes from the manufacturing sector. Toyota is an innovative company in the manufacturing industry. And Toyota gave the opportunity uh, to uh, all the people working in the assembly line to um, pull the London cord and to stop the manufacturing process if there was a flaw, a defect in manufacturing. So as soon as uh, an employee would see flaws in manufacturing, it could pull the cord and stop the manufacturing process totally. Clear costs. We used this principle for our customer service. So, if there is negative reviews on the product, for example, our members can decide to eliminate the product or temporarily suspend it, no longer to publish it on our website, and work with the manufacturer, the manufacturer to um, solve the problem of the product so that we make sure that our customers have good products. These are uh, just a few examples of how Amazon has targeted customers. So we do innovate, uh, having in mind what the customer wants to have. Now, the second pillar is connected to failure. In a technological business like ours, The likelihood of success and the uh, return on investment can be very different. So the likelihood of success can be very low, but return on investment can be very high. So if Amazon, for example, has one out of 100 possibilities to be successful and the return on investment, which is 100 times as much, Amazon will decide to continue to go for it. So we have many more opportunities, many more opportunities to fail, uh, but this is the way we innovate, and this is how we create something new and different. If you start innovating, knowing that things will be successful, probably you're not making having uh, an innovation, making an innovation, innovating, because probably this thing has already been experimented or tested in the past. But if we invested knowing that failure, uh, we're doomed to failure, then there's no innovation. So you have to invest and innovate by accepting the possibility to fail, failure. So innovation and uh, failure go hand in hand. Amazon can understand that, can accept that, but it's a very strict process. So you need to be careful. You really need to assess any single investment, and you must not be afraid of that. 
Amazon is afraid of not doing anything, be static or be slow. That could be a very significant risk for Amazon or any company, even SMEs, uh, working on innovation and in the digital world. The last pillar is uh, long-term uh, orientation. When you innovate, you have to think about the results of innovation in three or four years. If you look at today's results, they are the result of choices that were made three or four years ago. Results in three or four years are the results of choices that I'm making today. So it is crucial when you innovate to think ahead, to think in the long run. That implies uh, uh, an enormous effort. You need to really be focused on uh, big things and not details. And that does have an impact on the way you spend your time. If you want to innovate for something happening in three or four years, uh, you have to consider that some of your time and your ideas must be uh, focusing on uh, what you have to do in the long run and not tomorrow, which means that using your time in a different way. Amazon thinks that uh, the big things you have to focus on are always the same. Uh, select products for customers at low prices and very fast and meeting customer satisfaction. Our innovations always revolved around the four principles. To conclude, uh, I want to tell you about sharing. There is no innovation without sharing. So Amazon innovates. Successful innovations are shared with the final customer, uh, third companies. And I'll give you some examples. The marketplace is an example. I'll be very quick, yeah. Um, we understood how we can sell on the internet and we share it with companies on the marketplace. I've already told you about that. The second example is Amazon Web Services. Uh, we have a whole set of infrastructures and servers and an ab ability to analyze data and use artificial intelligence, which is a golden mine of uh, uh, the digital change. And we share it with uh, third companies. So it is absolutely crucial to share innovation in order to make uh, uh, the life of consumers and SMEs easier. Thank you. Now, let's continue with uh, uh, trade and e-commerce in particular. Uh, from, from this to uh, manufacturing, we have Ali Reza Rabnia. Uh, he is the chairman of a, a company uh, that he bought in 2005 when uh, Jayco uh, had uh, quite a few problems. He was a real entrepreneur. Before that, uh, he had worked in the same company. Uh, uh, he started working in that company in the 1980s in Nigeria. Uh, when he was younger, uh, he studied in the high school in Tehran, uh, where there were the 700 best Iranians. Then he studied in Europe, uh, in the US, uh, um, in the UK, in Milan. He bought this company, and in very few years, he emerged with Taikisha, hence Jayco Taikisha, which is now the world leader uh, in uh, 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 painting systems, automized uh, painting systems for cars. And uh, your uh, plants. Your factories are the first one uh, in the world with uh, uh, zero environmental impact. So paintings have zero environmental impact. This is certainly uh, a wonderful innovation. And you've done that uh, three years earlier than uh, anybody else. 
What is the innovation in all that? Where was the innovation in the decision-making process? And what is the impact of this the digitalization in that sector? Good evening. First of all, I would like to say that until a couple of years ago, I had no idea of what a hatred is. I didn't know anything about jealousy and hatred. But uh, over the last two years, I've started to hate Amazon. Well, the reason is that I've become a gatekeeper. Every given day, I get parcels every day. Even my daughter, my daughter just buys sorts of uh, pacifiers and soothers through Amazon and I get loads of passes every day. So, item number one. Item number two. I started working at Jayco in 2000 then I quit. Well, actually I've always been uh, faithful to the group but it had been uh, merged into the Kemal Fiat uh, group and I still had 49% of the shares but I also had another company that I owned that had been quoted and listed on the American uh, Stock Exchange and in 2000 there was a big trend about fashion and internet and so on and uh, so together with another 11 companies we were considered by financial analysts we have been criticized so much uh, we had 28% uh, of EBITDA and we were criticized because we uh, in our name there was no .com or .net so uh, out of these 11 companies uh, well the managing director of each company had started like uh, a sort of uh, very resigned uh, person and um, everybody started uh, very small and humble like uh, a sort of uh, a crestfallen and then at one point I said you accused us of being old economy just because you want just new economy but if old economy means that I have to think and not being the, the, the slave of tools then I think that uh, I am a sort of a prehistoric economy because industry should not be the slave of tools and devices. Tools and devices are just tools and devices. So they're just means to be used for my purposes. But when it comes to the architecture of a company, the architecture of industrial projects or business projects, strategies come from people, from people that need to have a vision and need to be able to analyze the market, to understand the market as Jeff Bezos did. So a little anecdote, my brother is younger than me and uh, is uh, an expert in the US of um, artificial intelligence. He's one of the greatest experts in the field. 20 years ago, maybe even more than that, I remember we were talking and he was criticizing uh, an Iranian friend of his, uh, of person origin. He said, oh, he, had, he got a terrible PhD. He didn't understand that we need to stop being merchants. We need to be sort of uh, innovative, uh, uh, AI, and so on. We need to do new things. And... Omidyar was the name of this friend. He is the founder of eBay. And Amazon, by the way, copied its uh, selling model, not just of books. Right. That person that had been considered as a merchant actually made a fortune, literally. My brother is still an academic. 
a researcher, a scholar is very happy with that, but certainly, well, it's a different league, so to speak, and everything is different and possibilities are different. After so many years, I told my brother that what we should do, because today we talk about uh, Industry 4.0, well, it was a German waking up one morning and creating this term, but actually, we did these things 20 years ago, not today, and in Italy, many companies started so long ago. You have, you, you have a, a great ability. Well, everybody says that the best uh, and the most beloved uh, sport in Italy is football, but actually you are the best to criticize yourselves. I don't know why you always complain. You keep complaining all the time. Why is it so? You have, uh, I mean, uh, uh, a lot of things that don't work, but how is it so that in spite of the bureaucracy that you have, uh, you are leaders in so many sectors? It's because you have very smart people, because otherwise there would be no other explanation. You say, I don't understand why you self-complain about yourselves. Uh, oh, we are this and that. Okay, you can criticize your establishment, your system, and that's it, but not yourselves. Uh, the 4.0 industry is a big, big, big opportunity, of course. Uh, well, there is the ethical uh, issue to be considered, and there are serious questions to be answered. That's a fact, and I do agree on that. But, well, my grandfather used to manufacture um, coaches and carriages, but at one point, if well, they are somehow substituted by cars. What can you do? You need to adapt, to evolve. Some things have become obsolete. It's normal. It's some jobs uh, existed 20 years ago, but not any longer. Do you remember uh, f f fax machine manufacturers and telex machines manufacturers? Many of you don't even know what I'm talking about. Well, they disappeared because somebody developed something new again. So at that time, there were up-to-date products, but they stopped existing. And so something else came along. And so you need uh, so to evolve. And I think that uh, you have uh, so much intelligence and strength. So certainly, well, I think that you can be far better than uh, people in other countries. And... I don't want to sort of uh, be biased, but I have 52 companies in the world in 28 different countries. And uh, we manufacture paint installations, car paint installations for car manufacturers. And no other country like Italy has so much creativity and imagination. I didn't say to flatter you. But it's just the truth. And so, even Industry 4.0 could be such a great opportunity for you. Of course, if, uh, well, we have uh, only young people graduating in some sectors and not in the sectors that are more strategic, of course, then you risk to have a mismatch between the uh, world of industry and the world of uh, university. Okay, everybody complains about the lack of technicians and engineers. And uh, I started in 82, and I must say that my first company was already manufacturing uh, car paint installation. And I remember that after a couple of months, there was a coup. And uh, so importing activities were blocked. And so I couldn't do anything uh, else. So what should I do? Oh, mom and dad, what shall I do? Shall we shut down everything because there was no more work? No, not at all. We came up with something new. We found a solution. And that's why we turned that problem into an opportunity. Then three years after that, we took up a company that was uh, going bankrupt and then 
they were manufacturing something that was becoming obsolete because our machines were used for a process uh, that was disappearing because um, solvent-based paints uh, were doomed to disappear so again we had to reinvent things to reorganize ourselves and then uh, that company has become top leader in the world and being listed on the american stock exchange then i bought back jaco well they did too many things and none good so we had to change things fiat was um, was sick had, and uh, again they were too much used to do everything as they usually did. But instead, we had to look at the market and see what the market needed, what the market requested. So, who are our customers, our clients? Who is buying? So, but I mean, we need to understand the needs of our clients. Every client has specific needs. So you need, first of all, to make a thorough market analysis, understand the more or less expressed needs that you can satisfy, and then according to your own resources, because then resources are important, you need to compare with what your competitors can offer. Well, we try to opt for the simplest way, instead of doing too much we decided to, to to concentrate on body painting installations and so we said to ourselves so let's forget size because we were very small so what can we do we can try to work on technological innovation that's what we did and we saw uh, i mean which was the most sensitive element the management cost because uh, these installations are very expensive uh, on an average uh, from 10 to 20 million dollars per year just of operating costs so reducing the amount of these costs could have been a big benefit to redefine uh, not only the price of the installation but more generally the price of the whole investment so we started from there and of course well at the beginning I remember that during the Innovation Day, we invited many stakeholders, only seven arrived, and they were all a bit worried. They thought that we were about to announce uh, sort of bankruptcy, not at all. We presented them with our business plan by 2020, and this comes from a Persian concept. I need to sort to create something sound and solid before going to before retiring so again that's what I wanted to do I wanted a zero co2 emission installation to be made with uh, a reduction of energy consumption uh, by 70 percent and uh, also to use renewable energies so and then we planned to have update meetings every two years and last year 7 november 2017 we were very proud to present onto the market our brand solution three years ahead of these uh, zero environmental impact uh, machine we have a turnover of uh, 2 billion 100 million however we have competitors that have uh, higher turnovers but they do also other things we are technological leaders in the world every year we win an award so the uh, world technological innovation award in our sector and we have been winning that for the last four years. I'm very proud of that because I'm not an engineer. So all through these years, I've been in charge of highly engineered uh, companies, uh, sometimes uh, in troubles, but without being an engineer. So these companies have been very successful just because I was not uh, an engineer, because I was not the one then doing things, because then uh, to do things, uh, to reach the strategic objectives, uh, 
they were very skilled people. That's why even for this project uh, that uh, wanted to have a zero environmental impact, uh, we started really from the management because we have more than 5,000 items in our installations that have to communicate with each other and say finding the right communication solutions so that uh, you can have uh, suitable uh, machine learning. These are, this is the, the lingo of the Internet of Things. Yeah, but I mean, don't be misled by words. The idea is that uh, there are components that could and should, through specific software programs, uh, sort of work together and communicate. And so, if uh, we were in a sort of uh, 4.0 lighting installation, so the lights would be smart enough to understand that I'm sweating too much and would turn down automatically. So, again, theoretically, I can have, for instance, uh, a connection with all my subcontractors all over the world. And so when I make an offer, I can start with a specific uh, mix that is the best uh, mix, uh, I don't know, a uh, factory in India that uh, can uh, make for me panels at lower cost of another factory that is in China. So I can get a message to, through, to my intranet Now our sort of avatar program that sends me the draft of drawings to assess what has to be done for that installation uh, that you can then adapt to different uh, regulatory settings and so on. This is as far as the in-house level is concerned. And then you can also find the best energy consumption and management solutions beyond the hardware and technology being used. But specifically, when it comes to software management in terms of virtual maintenance and so on, you can find the best solutions and you can improve the efficiency and so that you can have a 20% efficiency improvement by the 4.0 industry. And I can tell you that we had no idea of what uh, 4.0 industry was. That's what he had to do. But uh, some uh, car manufacturers came to visit us and uh, we are being already classified by 96.0, sorry, 96% as uh, a 4.0 company. To me, we are not so 4.0. And I say so not just because I'm ambitious and demanding, not at all, because I think we should do other things even more so. And what is the effect of all this on the people working on the body painting line and so on? So I can tell you what was the effect when painting was made by people, because, I mean, we prefer to have... A, uh, do we prefer to you have a robot? find the paint or people that risk to get sick because of the solvent. When we had welding robots with Kamau, they were masterpieces. If you had a look at their workshop, they had a wonderful, fantastic, incredible welding robots, welding everything. In the past, all those operations were made by men. Well, in the past, it was a very uh, heavy work to be carried out. And some people say, oh, today, I mean, uh, uh, that would be too hard for a man. So you see robots, I mean, but robots are self-manufactured? No, not at all. Robots are manufactured by men, by people. So look at the first, second, third. Uh, this is the first uh, industrial revolution. And if you have a look uh, at uh, all the sort of uh, newspapers, you will see always criticism, criticism, criticism and innovation, especially automated innovation. But actually then that brings about an improvement in the quality of employment and of labor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I would like to show you something, a video specifically. Yes, the video called
are these? This is our research center. Four point zero industry. It's silent, no sound. Well, everything you are saying are sections, extremely innovative sections of a body painting installation. This is the most advanced research center in the world and it's located in Chinizello Balsamo in the province of Milan. Yes, and it's the most beautiful, most advanced in the world. Yes, it is. Just for the record, you need at least 20,000 square meters. We made one in China, 200,000 square meters. And then we made another one in Germany with a height of 30 meters, another one with 14 meters. These are separate sections of an installation. Well, it was just a, a sort of technical precision. Right, so in very little time, we got so much information, but there's a commonality. The digital part is used as a tool, but actually, people always need to be there to make decisions because uh, we have seen that, uh, I mean, there has been a lot of risk by investing into these tools because, I mean, the outcome could have been different. Don't forget that. Nothing has to be taken for granted. So decisions always imply a risk. Let's now move on to any. A huge company, well, it was one of the largest, it's present in 73 countries, 33,000 staff, maybe even more by now, maybe these data are not updated, but still, let's now listen to the impact that digitization can have uh, on services. Marco Bardazzi is a journalist. He has been working for nine years in the US for the ANSA agency. Then he worked for La Stampa newspaper in Turin. Then he worked as digital editor and uh, is, very, is a big expert on digitization. But he started as a non-professional, as a journalist, so maybe he had the same kind of advantage that Mr. Arabnia had when he uh, took over technical companies not being a technician. So maybe these people have a different uh, gaze compared to specialists in this field. So the floor is yours. I'm not going to talk, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say poor things about things about engineers because uh, I work in an engineering company, but I try to uh, um, um, give a challenge to Cinisello Balsamo with San Donato uh, Milanese and the province of Pavia, where we also have a, a, a very nice company which is very um, interesting uh, uh, from a digital perspective. I have a few slides here. Uh, in order to make you understand what ENI does uh, in the digital world, ENI operates uh, in uh, over 70 countries, uh, 34,000 uh, people staff. The digital world uh, has always been present uh, in uh, any since the 1970s. We've always been using data for uh, um, uh, surveys, geological surveys and data analysis. So we've always been working in that. 
San Donato Milanese was, convinced, uh, was conceived by uh, uh, Mattei as a sort of Silicon Valley. However, this global out outlook requires us to think about the digital world um, uh, considering uh, the different contexts. To us, the digital world is a leverage uh, uh, leading us to uh, sustainable development, uh, to meet the sustainable goals uh, against a scenario based uh, on economic growth and access to energy and respect for the environment. Uh, these are all factors uh, that uh, the digital world can accelerate and help. But the world uh, is also made like this. So this is a bit strange compared to what you usually see. The world is measured by in terms of GDP, and you see the fat countries are uh, those uh, uh, where we are now, the Western world, and then uh, 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 there are others like the African continent in terms of GDP, it's uh, much smaller. So you have also to consider that when you talk about the digital world, you have to talk about uh, Russia and Latin America in terms of GDP, and the world will be different. Over the next years, if we think about uh, how to uh, reposition and uh, how to make uh, a di ra digital change over the next few years, uh, let's see what the world will be like in 2030. In grey, uh, you see the OECD countries, the 35, uh, uh, the 35 most developed countries. In terms of population, they have a very low population. In yellow, you see where population will grow, but GDP is the opposite, which does con influence our choices. Access to energy is certainly not even in the world, but based on expected uh, demographic growth over the next few years, it will strongly increase in the countries with the lowest GDP. There will be an increasing demand for energy, but as you can see on the map, uh, uh, the demand for energy is uh, uh, much higher in OECD uh, countries and not much uh, in the other non-OECD countries, uh, which still have to grow. Thinking about the digital world, you have to consider that. However, we know that the digital world is a wonderful opportunity. Now, uh, yeah, there is an opportunity for growth for everyone and for companies which are not as big as any, but it's an opportunity that today cannot be neglected because it offers a lot in terms of growth. If you want to use a digital leverage against a scenario taking account of energy, environment, uh, the digital world is a wonderful opportunity to reduce environmental impact. So digitalization can help growth, but at the same time, uh, it can uh, reduce uh, um, uh, carbon use. GDP is not even, growth population is not even, and even the digital world is not even. Russian countries, the, uh, the uh, uh, sorry, the countries in red are those that are more evolved in terms of uh, 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 digital. So in trying to uh, increase in access to energy, meeting the higher demand for energy, we need more energy, but we can't kill the world. So how can we strike a balance between the two? This is the challenge that we have taken on against a, a global scenario, uh, which is full of contradictions. Now, let's talk about any business model. Eni, as you all know, is a major energy company. It is and it will continue to be focusing on uh, its core business, oil and gas, uh, and uh, renewable sources of energy, uh, based on the concept and characteristics which you see to my right. Uh, so uh, focusing on effectiveness uh, and uh, growth and time to market, uh, 
and uh, uh, high value resources uh, which are part and parcel of our history and business but we will need to be carbon neutral in the long term that is we will need to reduce environmental impact and we will have to be increasingly positive for the society in African countries today the gas we produce is left in Africa and this is the dual flag this is the dual flag approach uh, we leave the gas there in order to produce energy electricity we produce in those countries the resources are their own resources the first thing we have to do is to transform them into electricity and energy enabling those countries to make steps forward As for the uh, uh, company and what is that's done, this is the uh, scenario up to uh, 2021. We have a four-year plans usually. Any is a, a, a company uh, having a successful digital uh, uh, story. Uh, many steps uh, have already been taken. They started to be taken a long while ago. And uh, that applies to all the different uh, phases of manufacturing and distribution. Following up to what you said beforehand, uh, you were talking about uh, people and technology. I think that digital uh, uh, revolution uh, needs uh, people, technologies and processes working together. We cannot think about uh, a digital change uh, as a technological solution only. You can't think that people alone, without tools, can make uh, a digital change. Processes are needed. And uh, processes do change, uh, approaches do change, as well as culture in a big company. And this is very interesting. That poses a whole new set of uh, questions. There are many criticalities in the digital world. For a big company in Italy, for example, wishing to work with startups, uh, criticalities are the fact that uh, uh, big companies now live, in, now live off the procurements which are very complex uh, for small companies. So uh, uh, having a due diligence because uh, you want to work for a major company, there are different steps which are required that you need to take. This is uh, a sort of criticality. We are trying to overcome the obstacles by working on processes and especially on people. We develop the technologies we have. But I think that all companies have to increasingly focus on processes. Here, uh, you can see many different steps uh, which are underway in uh, any. Uh, the digital transformation is connected to uh, smarter and smarter um, uh, installations. An installation operating in Ghana, for example, must have a digital twin in San Donato Milanese, where in a control room in the headquarters, everything can be replicated so that we can understand what's happening and we can prevent accidents. Digital transformation in any uh, is based on the asset integrity and safety. And in the business model that you saw beforehand, innovation and digitalization uh, are the uh, common points uh, helping us to uh, implement a circular economy model. So asset integrity, uh, uh, robotics, uh, sensors, uh, all our assets to make all that m safer and faster. And then there's a whole set of innovations uh, in our chain. Uh, any has been doing blockchain for one and a half years in order to manage international gas uh, uh, agreements. So the blockchain is used in order to uh, manage uh, international uh, uh, gas agreements, as I said. And uh, any also uh, changes the way 
uh, it provides energy to uh, the 8 million users, uh, Italian users using any for electricity, or else we provide an app. And we also uh, develop uh, uh, something new, the car sharing of Enjoy with 700,000 users in Italy. For car in, in the car sharing sector, we had a failure. There was a failure. It is always very important to fail, as we said. We can also fail in Italy. Even major companies can fail. Any uh, uh, tried to do the scooter sharing, moped sharing in Milan, but it didn't work out. Uh, it lasted one year, and then we stopped. Because uh, if you enter the world in the car sharing world, uh, you, you have to be ready to uh, be wrong and to invent solutions which do not yet exist. Now, uh, these are the uh, uh, numbers for uh, 2021, 100% uh, of digitalization in all our assets, reduction of uh, manufacturing costs, uh, uh, reduction of uh, uh, non-productive uh, time in installations uh, and uh, exploration times. Ferrere and Bognone, uh, near uh, uh, Pavia, we have this center, the digitalization center of ENI. It's very near Milan, where ENI recently has inaugurated the most powerful calculator worldwide. They don't even have it in Silicon Valley or, or even in Amazon. And it is a calculator. Uh, which is used to make calculations for explorations, for drillings. That it can produce uh, 22 petaflops of uh, uh, calculation power uh, uh, using uh, uh, what our children use uh, for their video games. I will show you a video uh, where we present this calculator. Thank you. Spero con la, con l'audio. Uh, hopefully there will be the sound. Yes, we've got the sound. Thank you. Thank you, Marco Bardazzi. We made some plans uh, uh, to have a second round uh, uh, of talks, uh, but uh, unfortunately we don't have time because we have to uh, finish by 8.15. I think that they uh, uh, gave us a lot of food for thought. What they said very clearly is that technologies don't have to be applied. They are tools that they have to be adapted and reinvented to any circumstance and in any situation. So we needed to think about uh, the reason, the purpose of these tools in order to adapt them. And this is a very important result because it means that uh, uh, each one of us uh, in their own company uh, has to adapt these tools. The digital world is also entering the world of professions. It is a wonderful opportunity, but we all need to be aware of the risks that we run. You can uh, uh, find many of the things that you have heard on the websites uh, or the Facebook pages of the uh, uh, companies that we talked about tonight. There's also uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, information and you can also find the data they gave you tonight because data can show uh, uh, developments, uh, future developments, uh, and uh, opportunities for innovation. 
which are enormous. I think that the title of the meeting, uh, talking about the forces move in history uh, in order to uh, make them men happy, uh, makes us understand that the innovation is a wonderful historical force. Uh, as Ravni said, uh, we cannot stop that because the four industrial revolutions went on and uh, they couldn't be stopped. The question is, can we use the potential of the Industrial Revolution for men to be happier or to the detriment of men's happy? Because innovation doesn't make us happier. Our life uh, uh, must tend towards happiness. And all these tools can be useful in order to make life more beautiful and more interesting. At the same time, if we think that these tools can make, up, can make us happier, uh, we give them an importance which they don't have. This is a, a wonderful teaching. I think uh, that the three people, the three speakers uh, of tonight uh, bear witness of the fact to bear witness of how these tools have to be used. They have to be used um, uh, in the long run. They have to be used um, in a far-sighted way. Thank you very much for being with us tonight, and uh, I wish all of you a successful meeting. Thank you.